know that Satan doesn't want us to be successful for the Lord, don't we? But have you ever thought how that he would go about the specifics in accomplishing that? Maybe this message will give us all some ideas about how he goes about this. And if he can get us to not do these eight things, then he has us just where he wants us. So let's look at eight things that Satan does not want us to do. And the first, Satan does not want us to go to church. Book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we're familiar with that passage of Scripture, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Well, that would be the end times. That would be the time when Jesus would come back. But yet today is one of those times when people seem to be going to church more, but those true churches are less and less. Amen. There are more churches that tickle the ears than that are preaching and standing for the truth. Amen. So he doesn't want us to go to church because the church is where the Word of God is read. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 11 and 12. When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Now you say, why have an Old Testament passage and this uh, 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 seemingly a New Testament and later message? Because the principles of the Old Testament are just as valid today as they were then. So if God wanted his people to gather together in a certain place, then he certainly wants us to do it today. Amen. Well, then we find that the church is where the Lord receives praise. Where the Lord receives praise. Book of the Psalms 84 and verse 4. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will but they will be still praising thee. Now you wonder why I don't pronounce that last word. Selah. For those of you who may not know, the word selah is like a musical rest. The Psalms, many of the Psalms, most of the Psalms, the majority of the Psalms, I'll get to that word in a minute, were written with the idea of either chanting or singing. And since there were no musical notes that were put into the Psalms, then the Psalmist would write the word Selah when there was to be a pause. So, and just as we, we come to uh, the particular connotation in music that wants us to pause for just a little bit. We don't say that, do we? We just observe it and then we go on. And so that's what that is. That, that didn't cost anything, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Then next, the church is where God is glorified. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, Unto him, unto God, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now, this is the passage of Scripture that we use to verify and to 
justify the fact that if you are not serving God in and through a local New Testament church, God does not get the glory for it. There are many worthwhile and worthy organizations that do good things and even as ministries. But if they are outside the scope and the authority of a local New Testament church, then God is not getting the glory. Because this passage of Scripture tells us that only through the church does God get the glory for what we do. Well, the next thing that Satan doesn't want us to do is to have a prayer, prayer life. Satan knows that when we pray, sin will be forgiven. Amen to that. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm that King David wrote after his indiscretion with Bathsheba. And the prophet came to him and told him, Thou art the man. And this is his psalm of repentance. Psalm 51, beginning with verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Satan knows when we pray that intercession will be made. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul in his letter, the first letter to Timothy, he said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Hmm. Some people we don't like to pray for do. Well, I ain't gonna pray for you. You know what he did to me? Well, I ain't gonna pray for her. You know what she said about me? Doesn't make any difference. God said through Paul that we were to be making prayers and supplications and intercession for all. Yeah. No matter how much we may like the President of the United States, we're still to pray for him. Or even our congressmen and senators, and I know you like to just blow them away sometimes and start all over again, but God said pray for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe we've got what we've got today because we haven't prayed for him like we should. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Satan knows that when we pray, petitions will be granted. Matthew chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Jesus said, Ask, 
and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asked bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asked a fish, will he, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Good question, huh? Mm -hmm. As long as we pray within the scope of the will of God, He will grant our petitions. Sometimes it might be yes, no, or wait a while. So thirdly, Satan doesn't want us to be a witness for the Lord. See, witnessing for the Lord would lead sinners to righteousness. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 6. Righteousness, righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Witnessing for the Lord will lead sinners to repentance. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And witnessing for the Lord will lead sinners to salvation. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Why does Satan not want us to witness for the Lord? Well, not only for these reasons, but God uses us to spread the gospel. And if we are not witnessing for Him, then it doesn't get spread, does it? Right. So that's the reason He doesn't want us to. Right. If He can get us to remain quiet whenever that we have an opportunity to speak up about our Lord, He has succeeded. And then Satan doesn't want us to trust God. Why? When we trust the Lord, we're safe. Proverbs 29 and verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. We honestly have nothing to be afraid of. Amen. Because we are in the Lord. When we trust the Lord, we have goodness. Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. When we trust the Lord, we have salvation. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse number 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Well, Satan doesn't want us to study the Word of God. Because studying the Word of God shows a heart of obedience. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul in the second letter to the young preacher Timothy said, Study to show thyself approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
You cannot rightly divide the word of truth unless you study it. And if it's possible to rightly divide the word of truth, it is also possible to wrongly divide the word of truth. Studying the Word of God aids in prevention of sin. Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. The more of God's Word that we have in our hearts and in our minds, the less we will sin. Now, we will never get to sinless perfection, mm -hmm. but we can see it less. Mm -hmm. Studying the Word of God will bring great joy. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I want to share this with you. Yesterday, Jeremy and, or Jamie and I, several times through the day, were discussing a subject that he's working on for future Sunday school classes. And he would find something, he would call me up. I just had to tell you, Dad. <laughs> I just had to share with you what I found. Do you know what a blessing that is? I told, I, I, I told Angela, I said, it is such a blessing to have your son to call you and discuss the Word of God with you. Oh, I tell you, that, that, that's a blessing, a real blessing and study the Word of God together. Mm -hmm. Albeit on the phone, that's okay. Well, Satan doesn't want us to be separate from the world. God does not want us to touch the unclean thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The church at Corinth had a problem. And among those problems, they had come out of paganism. And uh, the paganism that they were in was really particularly filthy in every way. Some of them had a problem getting away from it. God does not want us to follow after wickedness. In John chapter 11 and verse 14, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle. God doesn't want us to stand in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, excuse me, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Number seven. God does not want us to yield. Satan does. Sorry, you're right. Satan. <laughs> thank you. Satan does not want us to yield to the Holy Spirit. Boy, that would have been a mystery, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. See, you are paying attention. He doesn't want us to yield to the Holy Spirit because we are commanded to yield unto service. And go back to the Old Testament again to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse number 8. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto, unto the Lord. 
and enter into his sanctuary, whom he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. We're commanded to yield unto holiness. Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. We're commanded to yield unto God. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And then lastly, Satan does not want us to take a stand against sin. It's been said that all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see, to stand against sin is a personal affront to Satan. Book of James, chapter 4, and verse number 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now you know you're not going to get the latter until you do the former. Amen. Mm -hmm. To stand against sin is a determined commitment to serve God and Him alone. You see, we have to take a willful, determined stand against evil. Amen. Joshua said in Joshua 24, verse 15, Joshua serves as our example in the area of commitment. And he made this proclamation to the nation of Israel in Joshua 24 and verse 15. He said that if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. And incidentally, let me pause here for just a minute. The word Lord in all caps you find it that way in the Old Testament, you can know that it is referring to Jesus Christ. Okay? In 99.9% .9 of the times that it's used in this form in the Old Testament, it refers to Jesus. So Joshua said, if it seems evil to you to serve Jesus, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Amen. We will serve Jesus. To stand against sin is a declaration that what you believe and what you do is of paramount importance. 
Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, Paul said in his letter to the church in Rome, he said, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Every believer is a preacher. Not just what we call a pastor. You see, there's a big difference in those two words. The word preacher literally means proclaimer. Proclaimer. And it's a gender neuter word. And what does that mean? It means it makes no difference whether you're male or female. Now you get to the word pastor and it's an entirely different situation. The two are not the same. Every member of the church is a preacher. Amen. You may be a good one. You may be a bad one. Look at Acts chapter Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching word. Every one they is a pronoun that is also gender inclusive. Can be male or female. When the, when the church members of the church at Jerusalem were scattered because of the persecution that came down upon them, that was also part of the stoning of Stephen, all right, that was all in there together. When they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. In other words, every time that they had an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, they did. So in conclusion this morning, number one, preaching is a duty. It's a duty. It's not, well, I, I don't really want to. No. It's a have to. There's no want to in it. God commands it of us as church members. Is part of part and parcel of what being a church member is. Mm -hmm. So if you have an opportunity to tell someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't do it, you are not doing your duty. You are negligent in your duty. Mm -hmm. Preaching is a necessity. As we read the passage back in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, how then shall they call on him and whom they've not heard? How shall they believe in him of whom, uh, um, how they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without somebody to tell them? That's really what, what, what that passage says. They can't call on Jesus if they haven't believed. 
and they can't believe if they haven't heard of him. And how in the world are they going to hear unless we tell them? So therefore, preaching is a necessity. And then lastly, preaching is God's method to convert the soul. God has no other way for the gospel to be told by us. Or it can be printed, it can be recorded, it can be digitalized, it can be played back, but we are responsible for whatever form that is used of spreading the gospel. That's one reason why these ministries that our church has is so important. Because we are making the gospel of Jesus Christ available to the world. Father, I pray that we would not be negligent in doing our duty. And I pray that we would realize that telling others about Jesus Christ is an absolute necessity because that's the way that you have ordained that people hear about Jesus. Father, I pray that we would be obedient that we would fulfill our duties not only as your children but as church members to do what you would have us do. In Jesus' name we pray. Shall we stand?